individual classes, but we're just breaking them down by the subphyla. So what subphyla are spiders found in? Mm -hmm. Chelicerata. So <laughs> spiders have chelicerae, which have poison in them, and they are all carnivorous. So they either hunt their prey or they wait for their prey. Um, they use webs to capture their prey. So the next subphyla that we're going to look at is the subphyla crustacea. And so you can think of this as kind of being crusty because they have a thicker exoskeleton. So the thickened exoskeleton has to do with the fact that their, their exoskeleton also has calcium carbonate in it. So remember the exoskeleton of insects, for example, is composed of um, chitin. So it has calcium carbonate. So this is a little bit more protective than the exoskeleton, but it is also heavier. So most of the crustaceans are aquatic. So they're found, for example, in freshwater, but they're in abundance in marine environments. And so can anybody give me an example of a crustacean that you would find in your backyard? They have different names. Nope, a crustacean. They are terrestrial, would be. I call them pill bugs. Yeah, so in Pendleton, they call them potato bugs, but they roll up into like a circle, right? Those are crustaceans. Roly polies. Roly polies are terrestrial crustaceans. Most of the crustaceans are aquatic. That's the only example that I can think of that's a terrestrial. And so, for example, this would include crabs, lobsters, shrimp. And this is a very important one. This wouldn't be the barnacles. So barnacles are oftentimes confused with mollusks because they look like a mollusk in that they have two halves of a shell. So they kind of look like a bivalve, but they have jointed appendages that they use to feed. So they are actually uh, more related to lobsters and shrimp than they are to, um, to uh, clams, for example. We also see like in the Umatilla River, we see crayfish. So crayfish are also crustaceans. A lot of the organisms that we think of as zooplankton are also crustaceans. So plankton means that they just float in the water, right? So zooplankton can include things like krill, which are like little shrimp. And these are very significant because oftentimes krill, for example, makes up the basis of many of the aquatic food chains. So even some very large mammals like whales, like the baleen whale, actually moves through the water and filters the tiny crustaceans, the krill, out of the water. And that is what makes up their majority of their food. So there's got to be a lot of zooplankton in the ocean in order to support all of the other organisms that rely upon it, okay? So the biomass of krill is very large, even though they are tiny little organisms. Okay, so if we look at some examples of this, you might be confused sometimes with crabs because sometimes they use snail shells as shelters. So like hermit crabs use this, the shells that are discarded from snails and then they use that as protection. But they didn't actually secrete that shell, they're just using it out because it's something that they found in their environment for protection. Okay. So this is an example of an organism that is related to pill bugs, 
but it is marine. And so these are sometimes referred to as isopods. So this is a very large marine um, pill bug, essentially. And it can be larger in the water, why? Yes, because of the buoyancy of the water. So sometimes you hear stories about people in aquariums, at least when I was a kid, there was always this story about in the Newport Aquarium, there was some guy that carried off a huge lobster, right? So he picks up a lobster and he starts running and then he drops it and the shell cracks open and the lobster dies, right? Lobsters would not be able to survive in a terrestrial environment because they are just so heavy because of their exoskeleton. So that is what makes it so that we can have these really large arthropods in the water. Okay, so big crabs, big lobsters, right? Okay, so there is a really interesting example of an ectoparasite. And I'm calling this an ectoparasite, even though it is in the mouth of its host. And so this is a crustacean that attaches onto the tongue of its host fish. Fish have tongues in their oral cavity, in their pharynx, and water and food goes over and they can use, actually use their tongue, right, to manipulate food a little bit. They don't really generally chew their food, but to manipulate it so it can be swallowed. And so what happens is, is that this crustacean essentially eats the tongue and then it becomes the tongue. So it's actually functional. So this is not the tongue of a fish, but it looks kind of like it. But you can tell that it's not the tongue because it has eyes, right? Okay? So it attaches on, it feeds off the circulation. So it's feeding off the blood, much like a leech would, much like a hookworm in your gut would. So it could cause the fish to become anemic, but in general, it doesn't cause the fish to die. But this is an example of a parasitic mutualism, right? So it's a symbiosis, not mutualism, but a parasitic symbiosis is what I wanted to say. Because in general, one benefits while the other has some harm in that it probably has a hard time keeping up with the circulatory supply, right? It's blood production of blood. So it is harm. So this is different than when we saw the coral. That was an example of a mutualistic symbiosis where both species benefit. And we talked about other examples of this, like the ticks and the mites would also be examples of parasites. Those are actually examples of uh, Chelicerata, though. Those are related to the um, spiders and the scorpions. Those are shells? They have an exoskeleton. Yep. So that's their exoskeleton. Okay. So zooplankton, if you were to study it, the diversity in zooplankton is immense, and oftentimes they have these elaborate, elaborate um, jointed appendages. And so they might be filter feeders, so they might be feeding on algae. One of the examples of the zooplankton we saw last week in lab when we were um, looking at the daphnia. So daphnia is an example of zooplankton. Right? And that would be something that coral eats. So the Daphnia was a tiny crustacean. It kind of looked most like of these, maybe this one right here. So the diversity is amazing in the different species. And some people just specialize in looking at different types of zooplankton and their relative abundance. Okay. This is our Daphnia. So here you can see this is the eye, but these are the eggs. So this would be a female. They also have a kind of a hood-like structure. So they have an exoskeleton, and then they have these jointed appendages. And so they're just kind of filtering algae and other stuff from the water in order to eat. OK, so the last subphyla. So we had 
the Myriapoda, we had the Chelicerata, we had the Crustacea, now we have Hexapoda. So this is our last subphylum. So we have four subphyla you need to know. And this one's an easy one to remember because what does Hexapoda mean? Six. So this has six walking legs. So remember I told you that arachnids, spiders, have four total or two pairs. These have three pairs of walking legs. Okay. So this includes the insects. So insects are by far the most abundant group in the arthropods. So these would include things like beetles, butterflies, like grasshoppers, okay. So we talked about how beetles are the most abundant of all of the insects in terms of numbers of species because they can live in a variety of ways. So the other thing that's unique about these organisms is, is that they have three body parts. So three body segments. So if we look at the ancestor to these arthropods, they had multiple segments and some of them still do. So if you look at the centipede, there's it's many segmented segments. If you look at the millipede, it has many segments. And so these body segments are a fusion of segments. So if we're talking about the evolution of the insects, the segments fused so that we now have a head, an abdomen, oh, excuse me, a thorax, and an abdomen. Okay. So off of the head, we also have jointed appendages. So if we look at the jointed appendages on the head, this could include, in some cases, antennae. So antennae are modified jointed appendages. Also feeding mouth parts. So we'll just put mouth parts. So if we're talking about the jaws of a grasshopper, or if we're talking about the piercing mouth parts of a mosquito, those are modified appendages. So these would be the modified appendages that are coming off the head segment. The thorax has the walking legs. And then the abdomen sometimes has reproductive structures on it. So in the female, that would include the ovipositor. So what do you think the ovipositor does? Doesn't produce the eggs, but it posits the eggs, so it lays the eggs. So some insects have an ovipositor that pierces plants so that they can lay their eggs inside of the plants, right? Or pierces the ground so they can lay their eggs, or maybe even pierces a, a parasite or a host that they're going to parasitize to lay their structure, okay? And then the male's penis would also be another modified jointed appendage. Now one thing that is not a modified jointed appendage in insects are wings. So we say that wings are not homologous. So they're not from the same evolutionary origin or embryonic origin. They are not homologous to walking appendages to walking legs. And this is important to realize because if you think about birds, the bird wing is homologous to our arms, right? So bird wings are homologous because they're the same structure. They modified their appendage, their front appendage to become a wing. So the wings, there's kind of some theories as to how the wings came about, but they are just extensions of the exoskeleton on the back of the thorax. So extensions of exoskeleton on back of 
of thorax. Some, most, if they have wings, most insects have two pairs. Uh, flies have only one pair. Beetles, like ladybugs, which are actually beetles, actually have two pairs. One is a hard outer covering, and the other one underneath is more thin and membranous. It actually functions as the wing. So if we look at just an image that shows the diversity in the mouth parts. Oh, this is my grasshopper. So this just shows the structure of the grasshopper, the three pairs of um, walking legs, as well as the three body segments. Okay. If we look at the diversity of feeding mouth parts, this would be in a grasshopper. And so all of those mouth parts, including these little things on the front that actually help get the food into the mouth, but including their jaws. So their jaws, the way that they eat, that would also be a modified appendage. And then the housefly really truly does um, have kind of a sponge-like mouth. So it, it uh, regurgitates digestive enzymes onto the surface. And then it uses this sponge-like structure to sop up whatever has been digested. And the mosquitoes, these, all of that would just be modified jointed appendages, piercing, right? And then butterflies have really a cool uh, appendage that is a hollow tube that coils in. And then when they feed, they uncoil it and it is able to go really deep into flowers in order to um, get at the nectar in the flowers. So they're nectivorous as adults. Okay. So if we look at, oops, if we looked at the ecology of the insects and what they feed upon, oftentimes we see that we have two different strategies in terms of life cycle and ecology. So we have what is called, um, incomplete metamorphosis. And this is where we have an egg that hatches out into a nymph, which then grows into an adult. There's nothing there, so it's just nymph. And then it grows into the adult. And in this particular example, what it means is, is that the, um, the larval stage, the nymph stage, and the adult stage generally utilize the same resources. So I'm going to say the nymph is like a miniature adult. Right? So it's just a small adult. So the best one example of this would be grasshoppers. So if you've ever noticed early in the spring, you see these tiny little, they look so cute, right? These tiny little miniature grasshoppers. Those are the nymphs, and they're going to have to shed their exoskeleton repeatedly over time, and then they are going to emerge as an adult that has wings, right? So if you find an adult, it has wings, and that means that it is not going to grow anymore. Right, so it can disperse far distances using those wings. So it could make find mates and then go somewhere else to lay their eggs. So if we look at an example of this, right, these are just little grasshoppers and they're just growing and they eat the same thing. So they are herbivorous. They're eating your plants right, in your yard or in your garden. The opposite or kind of the uh, other example would be complete metamorphosis. And this is where we have an egg stage. We have a larvae stage. We have a pupae stage. And we have the adult. And the pupil stage generally doesn't do anything, but it's just the reorganization of all of the structures that are in the larva so that an adult can emerge. Is that yes. And so if you look at the larvae, some of these would include caterpillars. Oops. Uh. 
also caterpillars. So caterpillars um, generally are the larva form of butterflies and moths. And so if you think about it, it's quite amazing that the same genetic information, the same tissues, the same cells make up the larva as the adult. It's the same genome. It's the same tissues. They're just reorganized. So this pupil stage is actually kind of amazing, right? And so these types of organisms have been used extensively. Moths, for example, have been used extensively in the study of animal development and gene regulation. So if they can determine how the genes are turned on and turned off in that pupil stage, then we can um, have some um, idea about how it could possibly create the adult, okay? So we have some other, what about fly larva? Does anybody know what fly larva are called? Maggots, okay. How about beetles? Sometimes you find these um, when you're digging around in your yard and they can, be, they can be in the pupil stage, which is a hard case, or they could be white and they're called grubs. So that would be like the larvae of beetles are called grubs. Now, the interesting thing about these from an ecological perspective is, is that this allows for what is called resource partitioning between the larvae and the adult. So they don't use the same food, right? Caterpillars feed upon the green parts of the plant, the vegetative parts of the plant. Butterflies feed upon the nectar that is produced by the flowers. And so they're not in competition for, with one another for access to nutrients. And so this is one of the um, things that they think um, uh, explains why this type of life cycle might have evolved. We are trying to explain what would be the advantage of having complete metamorphosis versus incomplete. This one might be an example of that. Another good example are those larvae that are aquatic. So we have nymphs, they call them, right? And this is like dragonfly. And dragonfly nymphs can survive years in aquatic environment. They can even eat little fish. They can eat other invertebrates that are in the water. And then, then when they metamorphose, they go from an aquatic to a terrestrial. And so therefore, they're extremely partitions, right? And in the terrestrial, they're like little hunters. So they the reason why they're flitting around is if they're catching stuff on the wing. So they'll flit around and catch an insect. Maybe even they'll attack another dragonfly, maybe a smaller dragonfly, for example. And that's what they're eating when they're flying around like that. They also kind of flit around because they're territorial. So they're probably, if you see them near a pond or a river or a stream, they're probably actually trying to defend a territory and attract a mate that will come into their territory so that they can mate with her and she will deposit her leg, eggs in the water. Okay. okay, so if we look at some examples, pictures of these, this one is interesting. This is um, probably something that you've seen and you might not have known. Yes, Jason? Uh, can you throw nymphs in the complete uh, metamorphosis, but does that make them incomplete? I know, they still, they do call them nymphs even though it is complete metamorphosis, but they still call them nymphs. Yep. I'm not sure why that term persists. That's why I put dragonfly under yeah. there. So this is the larval form of the um, uh, ladybug. So you might see that, you know, you're like, what the heck is that? And that is actually just the larvae. And this always kind of cracks me up because it actually kind of looks like a piece of poop on your, on your leaves of your plants, right? Um, ladybugs can be very um, good because they eat aphids, and aphids um, are known to um, damage plants by parasitizing them and feeding on their juices. Beetles, so when you're digging around in the soil, you might come upon a grub, right? Then it pupates, and then it, it, it metamorphoses into the adult. So the larvae are actually underground, and the adults are tend to be above ground. And then the dragonfly, so this is my dragonfly nymph. 
And sometimes you can, if you're down by the river, you can see where they have um, undergone metamorphosis because you can find their little shells, right? They look like little, little nymphs and the adult has emerged from that and has left that behind on rocks or um, tree branches, for example. They are incomplete. So you'll find little tiny praying mantises around your yard that look just like the adults. Yep, the praying mantis tids are examples of incomplete metamorphosis. Okay, the other thing that I want to just briefly mention is this idea of the ecological service, right? So this is probably going to maybe be an essay question. So give me some examples of organisms that do or have an ecological service. And so we talked about aeration by the, um, the earthworms. That would be a service. I don't have to go and rent a machine, or I don't have to walk around. This is really annoying. Walk around in my yard with those shoes that have the spikes on them to try to aerate my grass, right? So they aerate the soil for you. Pollination is another big example of this. So this is an ecosystem service. And there's been a lot of press about this lately and lots of talking about it because we have, as the major pollinator of our, um, many of our crops, we have the European honey bee. Okay. So uh, all honey bees are non-native. So this is not native. And so it is actually an example of an exotic species. But it is very easy to manipulate because this is a colony, right? The colony, and it also creates honey. So I can have my beehives, and I could put my beehives on a truck and I could transport them from North Dakota down to California when the almond fields are pollinating, right? So I can actually transport. And so there's these, these massive industry that's around transporting the honeybees to the crops where they are needed. However, in recent years, we've come across a problem and they have labeled this, this problem the colony collapse disorder. So colony collapse disorder means that the colonies just disappear. They just like overnight, you have no bees in your bee boxes um, or you see massive die-offs, right? It could be that the bees have completely left or you could actually find them dead in their boxes. But this has been a really big issue because it's a huge number of colonies dying every year. And so if we look at some examples, this is um, total annual loss of bee colonies. And so starting in 2010, you see that it's up to over 35%. And then the biggest one recently was, I don't know what it is this year, but um, 2012, it was 40%. So last year or the year before, it was almost 40%, right? And so, they hypothesize that this could be a big problem for people that need their crops pollinated. So we're gonna see some crop failures. And there's all kinds of hypotheses as to why this is happening. So um, probable causes. And I would say that these are probably working in combination with one another. So um, this would include mites. So they have an ectoparasite that can get into the colony and essentially destroy it, okay? We also have viruses. We also have um, pesticides. And specifically the neo -nico Tenoids. See if I know how to spell that. Neonicotinoid, I think that's how you spell it. 
So this is the, a new nicotine-based pesticide. And so there is a lot of pressure for us to not spray um, using these types of pesticides and to also be really conscious of when we are spraying. Like you wouldn't want to go out and spray when the bees are working in your crop, right? Because then you're going to kill your bees because these pesticides kill all pollinators, okay? And then we have things like stress. So one way that we stress them is we move them. And the other thing is, is that we give them high fructose corn syrup to make them able to overwinter. So I'll put diet. So high fructose corn syrup. So instead of letting them pollinate flowers and get, you know, the nectar, we just give them high fructose corn syrup and then they build their hives from that. And that's their food that they have to overwinter. And I bet that's, that's not good for us because it affects our liver. It might not be good for them. So one of the things that scientists are trying to point attention to is, is that the European honeybee is not native. And so we have native bees. We have like 15,000 different species of native bees, right? The problem with our native bees is, is that they tend to not be colonial. So they're not usually colonial, which actually makes them a little bit less likely to attack you and sting you because they're not protecting anything. Right. So they also um, means that you cannot transport, right? So you can't transport them from one crop to another. So what they require is a moving away from monoculture to more polyculture where you have, um, you actually have your crops intermingled with native plants, right? So they need a stable food supply. Not monoculture. So you can't put them in the middle of a, um, of a place where there's only one kind of plant and it produces pollen and nectar for a month and then that's it, right? So they need diversity in their food supply. So some examples of the native bees that you might know are bumblebees, sweat bees. The sweat bees are tiny and little. And so if you come across a plant that has lots of bees on it, if you stop and you actually look, you would notice that there's these tiny little, you know, organisms that are all over it. And those are actually tiny native bees, okay? We also have cutter bees, which cut um, stuff. Um, we also have carpenter bees. And so probably perhaps the best way to go was to change up our, the way that we grow food and we can rely upon native bees rather than having to import and export the honeybees. These are actually, generally, they're, they've been found to be more efficient pollinators. So you might have seen, like on Facebook, people building bee houses. So they put together like bamboo and twigs and they create this little cool structure. And mason bees are another one. You can actually buy mason bee houses, mason bees. You can make them too. Oh, I can't write on this part, mason bees. So you can drill little holes in the wood and the mason bees actually use dirt. They lay their eggs in the hole and then they cover it up with dirt. Okay. So native bees tend to be efficient pollinators. Yep. Like, can you tell the difference between a honeybee and a bumblebee? Yes. What's the difference? Bumblebees are usually bigger and they usually are hairier. So 
uh, honeybees tend to not have as much hair on their body. Yeah. And unfortunately, wasps are not bees, but they are a pollinators, but they tend to be really annoying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's look at our, um, our uh, phylum again. And I actually want to take a moment here and draw it out. So you're going to need to draw out a, a phylogeny. And then I'm going to let you work in a little group to see whether or not you can fill it in as to what you think the characteristics should be. Okay, so I'm going to start here with my phylogeny. So I'm going to put sponges here. I'm going to draw another line down here. And I'm going to put jellyfish and planaria. Then I'm going to draw a line here. And I'm going to put mollusks and annelids. And I'll see if I can get this all on one. And then arthropods and nematodes. So a mollusk would be like a snail, earthworm, butterfly, roundworm, hookworm. Okay. So what I want you to do is have this sketched out, right? And then I want you to put characteristics. So what would be a characteristic that you could put right here? What do all of those organisms share? No. So only the arthropods and the nematodes have an exoskeleton. Um, they are all invertebrates, but that doesn't give us um, how they differ from sponges. So how do they differ from sponges? What do they have? <laughs> no, yeah, but they have tissues. I love that word. I've never heard that word before. Poriferous. <laughs> that is a cool word. I've just never heard it used in terms of they don't have pores. They do have pores. They have holes in them, but they don't. They're not filter feeders. Although the jellyfish are kind of. Yeah. Okay. So what would you put under jellyfish? So this is the question. What might you put here, 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 here? Okay. Just take a moment and see if you can figure out where, what would you put in those particular, oops, those particular places? Actually, we could do here too. And there's more than one right answer. If you need to use the bathroom, we're going to drink the water. This would be a good time to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So probably the easiest one would be the arthropods since we just talked about those guys. What do you think? What might they have that is unique? Titan, so they have an exoskeleton, but so do the nematodes. So we could put exoskeleton right here. Oops, exo. Yes. So this is jointed appendages. They also have segmentation, so you can put jointed appendages and segmentation. Do the nematodes have segmentation? No. They do have a complete digestive tract, but that would actually go here. digestive tract so if these guys have a complete digestive tract then these guys up here would have what incomplete okay how many tissue layers does the jellyfish have Two. So they are said to be diploblastic. My planaria, however, are what? Triploblastic. All of these organisms would also be triploblastic. So in my cladogram, it's correct, but I have triploblastic twice, which might not mean that it's the most parsimonious explanation for the relationships. What about a body cavity? Does the planaria have a body cavity, a coelom? No. So we say, we'll put no coelom. These are triploblastic with a coelom. However, the nematodes, they actually have a false coelom. So they would be said, they are pseudo coelomates, which means that their body cavity is only partially lined with mesoderm. So mollusks have a coelom, annelids have a coelom, arthropods have a coelom. What would be a good example for mollusks? What is some unique 
characteristics that mollusks might have. Mantle, so you could put a mantle here. You could also on the on this one on the annelids put segmentation. So remember that would be, have evolved twice because the mollusks do not have segmentation, just the annelids do. What about symmetry? Where might I put distinguish between symmetry? What did the jellyfish have? Radial symmetry, the planaria? Bilateral. And then all of these organisms have what? Bilateral, right? So I could put bilateral. And then I'd have to put bilateral up here. That is a good question. So the question is, what do these guys have in common? And I'm not sure. I think it has to do with, if we go back to their larvae, so this term right here you do not need to know. It's kind of a weird term, but it's called Lofa trochozoa, and it has to do with the type of larvae that they have. So the larval stage of mollusks and annelids is very similar. Okay, so you could put similar larvae under oops, topic. Under this one. So similar larvae you could write there. Okay. So on the quiz next week, we're going to have, I'm going to have um, an example of a cladogram like this, and I'm going to say, what would go there? And then you have multiple choice examples. Okay. So we are actually starting a new group. And so I want to pay attention to this idea of the complete digestive tract right here, because in this new group, we're going to talk about how that digestive tract forms. So all of these organisms that we have just gone over are considered to be protostomes. Right? So in even to be a protostome you, or a deuterostome, you have to have a complete digestive tract. Because what this means is, is that the first opening in the larva is going to be the mouth. So proto means first opening becomes the mouth. Okay. So if we look back at our invertebrates, these are the last two groups that we are going to look at. So the echinoderms and the chordates. Notice that they are separate from the protostomes in that they are deuterostomes. So that means that the second opening becomes the mouth and the first opening becomes the anus. Okay. So that was a big deal in terms of evolutionary history of animals because generally early thing, things in early stages of development do not change. Okay, okay. so echinoderms. They are deuterostomes. They also have a really interesting um, symmetry because in the larvae, they have bilateral symmetry. But in the adults, they have radial symmetry. So if you'll remember when we were talking about the planaria, one thing that happens when we go from bilateral to radial or radial to bilateral is we gain or lose a central nervous system. And that is called cephalization. So when they're bilaterally symmetric, they have a brain. 
So the larvae have a brain. When they're radially symmetric, they have lost their brain and they have nerve ring. They have a nerve ring and nerves that run down into each arm. So the nerve ring is not technically a brain. So not a brain. Because when you're radially symmetric, you can move through your environment in any direction, right? You're not head first and tail last. So they can move through their environment in any direction. So they have no centralized area where they have more nervous tissue than not, right? So they a ring and then it goes out into their legs. So if we look at some examples of these, you were not going to look at classes, so you don't need to know any of the classes in this group, but this includes sea stars, sea cucumbers, that's an M, sea cucumbers, sea urchins, sand dollars, and brittle stars. The, these organisms do not have an exoskeleton, so they have no exoskeleton, but they have an internal endoskeleton. So they have an endoskeleton, and in many cases, the endoskeleton has spines. And this is most observable in the sea urchins that have these long spines that extend out. They have tissue that covers those spines. The other thing that's really interesting about them is, is that they have a unique physiological system. So a unique system. And that means that this system is not found in any other invertebrate or vertebrate and it is called the water vascular system. Now, when you talk about vascular, you might get confused with circulation. So like circulatory system, this is not the circulatory system. You might get confused with respiration because respiratory tissue is generally highly vascular. This is not respiration. So the water vascular system has two functions. This is locomotion, and feeding. It is said to be water because it is open and filled, open to the environment, and it is filled with seawater. So water comes in through a filter, a sieve, and then it connects to a ring and then it connects to vessels that go out into each arm. And ultimately it connects to the tube foot. So it includes the tube feet. So if we look at this connection, this would be filled with seawater, this is a tube. You have a bulb-like structure here, and then you have a tube foot which is uh, extending out and in connects to the environment. Okay, so there's my tube foot. I have skeletal muscle here and here. So it's very much like a pipette or a syringe. So what happens is, is that you can contract that bowl or they can contract that bowl and then the foot will extend. And then if that foot then latches onto a substrate, the tube foot can get sucked onto it. And that creates a hydraulic pressure. And you do not, or they do not have to continue constricting, constricting these muscles. These muscles can relax, but they're like sucked on, right? So if you've ever tried to pry a sea star off of a rock, you know that they're sucked onto it. They're not using energy, right? If, if they had to use energy to stay sucked on, they wouldn't be able to survive, right? Because they would need too much food. So the hydraulic system, the hydraulic pressure allows them to do that. They also use the hydraulic pressure to feed. 
okay? So I'm gonna show you a little video that shows a time-lapse video of sea stars. And so they don't move like this, they move much slower. But if you take a video of them and you speed it up, you can see that they have quite a bit of a complex behavior. Like an advancing army, the sea stars move into position, slowly but surely working their way up toward their victims. The muscles cannot run or fight. All they can do is hide within their shells as their killers crawl over their bodies. Sensory tube feet sweep over the tightly packed mass of shells, searching for any gap in the muscle's defenses. Settling on its victim, the sea star hunkers down and begins its attack. The miniature camera tucked within the muscle's shell gives us the first look ever at the carnage that unfolds here every day. Once the tube feet have physically breached the muscle's defensive line, the sea star's translucent stomach begins the final assault. The animal actually pushes its stomach inside the muscle's shell, unfolding like a fatal flower. The stomach unleashes a volley of chemical weapons, digestive juices that dissolve the muscle's soft pink flesh. All that's left is a nutrient-rich soup, a broth that's quickly absorbed by the sea star. Having assimilated the muscle, the sea star stomach pulls away. And the animal moves on, leaving behind an empty shell. Without the benefit of speed, brains, or brawn, sea stars are amazingly successful predators. Okay. So it's kind of interesting, if we look at the diagram here, there is no head end. Let me get my diagram up. There is no actual head end. So the, the surface that you um, see when you're looking at a sea star is called the aboral side. You don't need to know that word. But on the bottom of it is it going to be its mouth. So its anus is located up here, and its mouth is underneath, and it is able to eject its stomachs, right? So it's actually got two stomachs, and it kind of ejects them, digests, and then it can pull its stomach back up. So this is a diagram that shows the digestive glands, also shows the tube feet, and then there would also be reproductive structures that extend out into each leg too. And these typically have little photoreceptors that are located on each leg. So they do have some ability to detect and see light, probably not images, but they can respond to sensation of light. So if we look at all of these organisms that are considered to be um, echinoderms, they all have that radial symmetry the sea urchin, the arms are kind of actually folded up, right? So it creates more of a structure like this. And then the sea cucumber is really soft body, but it has these um, rows of tube feet along its surface. And then it has these structures, tube feet structures near its mouth, where it just kind of moves along. And it's kind of like a vacuum cleaner. It just kind of moves and funnels stuff into its mouth. So 
that's why these are all uh, grouped together into the same phylum, the phylum Echinodermata. Any questions about that? Okay, so we're going to move on to the last phylum that we're talking about, which is the phylum Chordata. And I forgot to open that one, so it would be just a second here. So like the echinoderms, we are deuterostomes. So we are triploblastic, we have a coelom, we have a complete digestive tract, and our development is a deuterostome development. So in a lot of labs, they actually use sea urchins because you can get sea urchins to release their egg and sperm quite easily into the environment. And they are able to develop the larvae and then they study the larvae to better understand um, the development of our phylum as well. So I'm handing out a homework. This is the last homework um, before the midterm. So this is a video that you need to watch and then answer these questions. So this video is on biointeractive. So I forgot to put that on this sheet. So it's biointeractive.org. I might want to write that. Um, maybe. So this is due a week from today. Our midterm is not next week, but our midterm is the following Monday. It is the 12th. Okay. I also have another handout, and this is um, one that is going to go with our lecture on four dates. So I'll just pass. And when is this due? Monday? Uh, Wednesday. Next Wednesday? Yeah, the 7th. Mm -hmm. I Biointeractive.org. I can write that up here. So just write that on here because if you go there and you just typed in, you type in uh, the name of that title. I can also put this in Canvas. Okay. So the handout that I just gave you is a cladogram showing the relationship between um, the chordates and the kinoderms. So you'll notice that um, not all of the chordates are vertebrates. So if we look at on the, on the side here, these would be all of the chordates, but these starting right here are the vertebrates. So notice that that shows me that not all of these organisms that are in the same phylum as us actually have vertebrae. So we can ask why are all of these organisms grouped together? And so then we need to talk about chordate characteristics. So these are the chordate characteristics. So we would have all of these characteristics at some point during our development, okay? So the first one is a nodochord. And hence, you see that CH, 
that is what is referred to as the cord eight, right? That's why we're called cord eights, is, is that in our embryonic development, we have a notochord. And this is a solid rod of cells, well, but tissues, where muscles attach. So if I looked at it in this diagram, this would be my notochord. So it'd be kind of in the middle and it would be near the muscles. So these little things right here would be the muscle segments. This is then going to become actually my vertebrae. And so the remnant of my notochord um, would be my intervertebral discs. So in invertebrates, the remnant of the notochord, what's left over is the intervertebral discs. So those are the discs that become herniated. That's the connective tissue that pads and is found between each of my vertebrae. And sometimes that can herniate and cause pressure on my nervous system. So that's the second thing that all chordates have is a hollow dorsal nerve cord. Now notice that cord does not have an H. So that doesn't refer to the fact that we're chordates. So if you look at the other organisms like arthropods like honeybees and earthworms, they do not have a hollow dorsal nerve cord. They actually have a ventral nervous system. So it'd be like having your nervous system running down your belly and it is solid. So this is versus a solid ventral nervous system. So for example, earthworms have a solid nervous system that runs down the length of their bellies and they're segmented so they have little ganglia in each segment which helps to regulate the movement of those segments which allows that worm to coordinate its movement and be able to burrow through soil okay so this is my hollow dorsal nerve cord so even my brain is filled with fluid because i have structures called ventricles so I have these spaces in my brain that are called ventricles, and those are bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. And then the center of my spinal cord also has a hole in it. And that is my, where my cerebral spinal fluid is found. Okay, So it is interesting because it's hollow. The other characteristic, the third one, would be the pharyngeal gill slits. So this is our pharynx is in the back of our throat before we get to the esophagus and the trachea. So the back of our throat is called the pharynx. And even during embryonic development, we have gill um, structures. So that would be something that we have during embryonic development that we get rid of. However, we do have a bone that sits right here in our neck that is believed to be a remnant of an ancestral gill. Does anybody know what that bone is called? Dustin should know, we just talked about it in a &P. <laughs> You have a bone that sits right here. Does anybody know? It's called the hyoid. Your hyoid bone sits right here and it just floats right there. And it's believed to be remnant of a gill bar that would support the gill slits. So we still have pharyngeal gill slits in fish. So vertebrates retain those gill slits and they're used in respiration and feeding. So in some, it is, oops, is, it is used in respiration and feeding. So now, weirdly, we have our respiratory system and our digestive system combined. 
If you think about an earthworm, an earthworm breathes through its skin, it eats through its mouth. If you think about a honeybee, honeybees have holes in their abdomen through which they breathe, and then they feed through their mouth. We have one common opening, our pharynx, which leads to both our respiratory system and our digestive system, which means that we breathe and eat at the same time, which can be sometimes very bad, right? lead to bad things happening if we get stuff stuck in the trachea, okay? But that is just the, from the way that we develop, okay? The other characteristic, the fourth one, is the post-enal tail. Even we have a post-anal tail. So we have um, uh, bones called the coccyx bone, which extends beyond our spinal cord. But the post-anal tail is important because if you think about um, insects, they have a mouth at one end, they have an anus at the other. When we get to the chordates, we have a mouth, we have an anus, and then we have a tail. So this means that the tail extends beyond the anus. So here we have the anus and then we have this tail. This can be important in locomotion. Some people even believe that our tail bone is still important because if you talk to dancers or anything, sometimes they talk about how important it is for balance, right? So it can be used for also for balance. Okay, but we have a post anal tail. It becomes reduced as we develop and then when we're born, it's not noticeable from the external, okay? So those are the four chordate characteristics that you need to know. So let's look at a group of what are referred to as the invertebrates chordates. This means that they do not have vertebrae, but they're still chordates. And there's two of them, two groups. The first one is called the urochordata. These guys have a funny um, common name, which means that they're called sea squirts. Sometimes they're also called tunicates. Now, they can be mistaken for sponges because in the adult, they have gotten rid of all of their chordate characteristic except for the gill slits. So the larvae have all four characteristics. The adults have only one. So they are sessile filter feeders with pharyngeal gill slits. So they got rid of their hollow doser note cord, they got rid of their notochord, they got rid of their postanal tail, and they look kind of like this, right? Water is taken in, it goes through the tunic, hence sometimes they're called tunicates, and then it goes out through the excurrent pore. So if you pick them up, they tend to squirt water at you. Yeah. Now it's a big deal if you go down to the Caribbean and you're snorkeling and your guide says, I'm gonna take you to an island that has tunicates because there are only particular places where you can actually observe the tunicates kind of in the wild. And again, they're sometimes confused with um, sponges. Do I have a picture of those? No, oh, I don't have a picture. I'll bring in a picture of that. Okay, the other group of um, invertebrate chordates are called the cephalochordates. And the common name for here of this organism is called the lancelet. And so it is shaped like a lance. This is believed to be the 
um, kind of the ancestor to the vertebrates because as an adult and the larvae, they all have four those four characteristics. So the adults retain all characters. Okay. So they have a notochord, a holodosal notochord, they have pharyngeal gill slits, and they have a tail. And so these don't get very big. They only get to be a few centimeters in length but they burrow themselves down into the sand and then they filter the water. They look very similar to another organism that we're going to look at, which is the lamprey, because the larval lamprey actually look very similar to this organism. Lamprey are vertebrates, but they're jawless vertebrates. Okay, so this is the last group that we'll talk about. These are the craniates. And so this means that they have a skull, but they have no vertebrae. Um, you know, they're not a class. They're just a grouping. Um, they could be, I don't think it's a subphyla. I'm not sure. Um, I, the vertebrates are a subphyla. This is just, I'm not sure what, what it would be. If it's a subkingdom? No, 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 it would be a subphylum. Subphylum, I mean, not a, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, so these include the hag fish. And these are scavengers. They are kind of similar to lamprey, but lamprey are parasites. They tend to be ectoparasites. These actually scavenge on dead carcasses in the bottom of the ocean. They're what? Yes. So the last thing we're gonna do today is we're gonna watch just a short video that looks at some specific adaptation that makes the hagfish able to survive and be protected against predation. The first time I saw a hagfish was while I was volunteering here at Scripps back in high school. My predecessor, Ron McConaughey, was the old hand. Oops, sorry at collecting animals. He was a great collector. So one day, Ron asked me to go out and help him collect some of these animals out in the La Jolla Canyon offshore. We went out. I had no idea what to expect other than he handed me a line and said, pull. A thousand feet later, up came this small minnow trap that was filled with these wildly squiggling animals and leeching with this very strange mucus snot type mixture. Okay, let's see. Uh... Now, because I knew you guys were coming today, we uh, set up a small aquarium to show what the hagfish look like, maybe out in the deep sea. We collected these animals from about a mile and a half from where we're standing right now, out in about a thousand feet in the submarine canyon just offshore here in La Jolla. So in the world, there's about 64 species that have been described throughout all oceans and basically most of the deep sea environment. This species is Epitreta stauda, and it's known as the Pacific hagfish. Uh, it has this nice dark pink on the top with a white bottom underneath. They don't have true eyes. Instead, they have this small eye spot that you can see right here. It's not a complex eye by any means. They're actually virtually blind, um, but they rely on other senses, like their sense of smell, which is highly acute, and their sense of touch. The, the animal has probably adapted this very smooth body so that it can move around very easily when it's inside of a dead whale or a dolphin. 
Okay, so the way you see these animals coiled up like this is probably the way they spend a lot of their time down on the deep sea. Now, hagfish don't have true jaws like most fishes out in the water. What they do is they have this rasping like tongue. They'll swim over to whatever they want to feed on, latch into it, and they're able to tie their bodies into a knot and move that knot up and down their bodies. So what they'll do, they'll grab onto that whale, make a knot, push that knot down its body until the knot is pressed up against the whale, and then they're able to pull their head out with that mouth full of flesh, and that's the way they eat. They'll do that a few times until they're able to make a big enough hole to where they can then even actually go inside this animal and eat it from the inside out. It's just amazing what these can do. But the most unique thing is this slimy capability that they have. Just one of these can turn an aquarium like this into solid slime in about three seconds. They use this as a defense mechanism to escape from predators and anything else that they want to completely repulse, including myself when I first saw these animals. Because hagfish are such good slimers, we found this to be a pretty good way to transfer animals from one container to another. This is what happens. And so this is just a little bit compared to what one animal can make out in the wild. And as you can see, it's a very unique type of structure. It's not the most appetizing thing in the world. Matter of fact, this is enough to suffocate some fish. And as you can see, it's just really thick, amazing type stuff. Now, you might wonder, what is this stuff? Well, it's a protein, and the molecules are stored in those little slime glands that we saw earlier along the sides of the body. When the animal puts this protein into the water, the protein explodes. So this slime is probably the reason why these animals have survived for 300 million years, is that it's an amazing defense mechanism. I'm disgusted, and I can only imagine what a predator might feel if it should end up with a mouthful of this stuff. I'm fortunate enough to have interns here work with me over the summer. Her name is Lily Bullock, and this is the first time Lily has ever seen slime like this before. And if you want, okay, good, you're bold enough to hold on to the stuff. What's it feel like? It's <laughs> Um, kind of, yeah, kind of rubbery, actually, and very slippery, and <laughs> pretty weird stuff. Great to use for Halloween, huh? Okay, so you want to write down underneath the hagfish, the mechanism of defense is the production of slime. Ecological significance is, is that they are scavengers, so they remove dead carcasses from the bottom of the ocean. So I will see you tomorrow for lab. Yes. Does anybody else have homework to turn in? Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the. I was on camera when there was like the lizard class. The lizard class. Okay, I don't think. I might have been sick for it, but I don't know. Did you print it out? No. You could print it out and turn it in. Okay. Turn it on so we don't like print it um, I might have to take more. I might be 30 percent off. Better to turn it in and actually yeah. do it because then I'll help you with your diagrams. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Did you get mine the other day? I Did you put it under my drawer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I had like walked in and put it like on anything. It was open. Okay. I walked in. I don't know. I think I got, got it. it then. All right. Cool. This here was just an extra handout. Right? We didn't have to. I mean, we have a lab to do, but this is not part of that. This was just the information that we were to get. We are trying to find the color. Actually, I was hoping that you would write that down and put this in your lab notebook because you got this in lab, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I was hoping you'd answer this question. Just add on that piece of paper. Yeah. And we can
Okay. Thank you. Because you're turning in your lab notebooks this this okay. tomorrow. tomorrow. Yep. Yep. Was for the informal reports, um, especially for this number two, the second formal report revolving around um, the background of elimination behavior, and then we had to take it all that stuff off the board. We didn't like we didn't need to have a picture of that anything inside the informal report, did we? Did you have that? You wrote it down as a table. Um, well, I actually took a picture of it, then I put the table in a nice little worksheet. That's so fine. I the two. Would you want like the? I don't need the picture. If you have it in the table, that's all you. Okay. So just as long as you have the data on okay. the board. Okay. Okay. Like, like, on. Yeah. Like I didn't. I had to take a picture of it and I put it in an Excel worksheet, but I haven't like, put it on a piece of paper to turn into the informal report. So I was wondering if you actually wanted it. Yes, I want the data. So you have to have the data in the informal under results. Okay. Yeah. yeah like so I have some way you could write it down by hand. Okay. Or it just insert or print the picture. the picture. Okay. And put it in there. All right. And then the other question was more of a curiosity. So you know in the river down here, you see those little critters that cover themselves with like pebble shells? What are they? Those are uh, fly larvae, caddis fly larva. Okay, and so they just, they... They would probably, um, they that's their larval stage, and then they metamorphose and become, uh, they come out and fly around. Okay, okay, I just, I didn't know they're... I know, they pinch you. You sit around there too long. I've been pinched by them. That I have had happened. 